If a person can only be saved by believing in Jesus, then how could people who live before Jesus be saved? And why does the Bible talk so much about blood? You go to a church and you hear people singing nothing but the blood. Um, it's not a normal thing that people will talk about often. And also, how does Jesus' sacrifice work? These are three of the questions which we will be looking at today. Uh, Hebrews is a very deep book with a lot of very rich theological themes. Um, and so we want to try to take what is complex and sometimes a bit difficult to understand and make it uh, simple and also applicable to our lives today. Uh, my name is Jason and today we will be studying together in Hebrews 9 verses 15 through 28. Uh, so let us read the first three verses and get started. It says, Therefore he, that's Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Before we get into the passage, let's ask God's blessing upon our time today. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Uh, we acknowledge that the passage is uh, a bit uh, challenging, but Lord, it's rich and it's deep, and we ask that the Holy Spirit will give us understanding and insight. Lord, please open our eyes, please open our hearts, please help us to focus without distraction, and Lord, help us to understand more uh, than we understood before, and help us to have a greater desire, Lord, to uh, put your word into practice in our lives. Let it be living, let it be active in our hearts, and change our attitude toward you and towards those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So let's discuss this, then we'll move forward to the next section. It says, therefore, he is the mediator. Uh, he being Christ, so Jesus is often called a mediator uh, in Scripture. We can also see this in 1 Timothy 2.5. It says, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So a mediator is someone who goes in between. He goes in between two different parties, um, perhaps seeking common ground between these parties. If you have two parties which are in conflict or disagreement, a mediator may try to mediate peace between these two parties or these two nations. Uh, a mediator also may um, bring messages back and forth or bring um, one person's petition uh, to the other side or represent one side to the other side. So Jesus is the go-in-between. He brings God's message to us. He brings God's law, God's standard uh, to us, also God's grace to us. And on the other hand, he takes our uh, petitions to the Lord. He represents us before the Father. Um, and as our representative, then he can also... Uh, take away our sins. He can represent us before the Father as a man and therefore die um, on behalf of us, die on behalf of our sins. Um, so basically the incarnation, uh, that is the act of Jesus the Son taking on human flesh was necessary because only a man could represent us in order to save us. Why? Because sin entered into the world through a man, uh, through Adam, and the Savior also has to be a man as well. So Jesus became a man in order to represent us before God and in order to save us. Uh, he is the God-man. So because he's God, he has no sin, he has the ability to take away our sins, because he's man, he's our representative. So Jesus is the bridge or the mediator between God and man. Uh, what is the application we can get from this? Well, one is we should have a close relationship with Jesus. Um, without him, we cannot come to God the Father. Uh, we have no way uh, to do that. And without him, we cannot be successful in anything that we do. Uh, John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, without him, we can do nothing. He is our mediator. He is the one who brings us uh, strength, who brings us help. He's the one we need to depend on. He's the one who brings us success. Um, so we need to be depending on him. So the Christian life is not just about going to church, uh, reading the Bible, praying. These are means to an end, but they are not the end itself. Uh, the end goal is to come to the Lord, uh, to behold him in his glory, to worship him, um, and to make him known. 
Um, as it says in uh, one of the creeds, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Uh, we can only do that through our relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, now the first question, how can people who came before Jesus be saved? If it's through believing in Jesus that a person can be saved. Perhaps someone has asked you this question before, or perhaps it's something that you've thought about it before. Now, in the last few chapters, we've seen the weaknesses and the flaws of the Mosaic Covenant. We see that he even says um, that it is useless and weak for saving people. It cannot actually save anyone. It cannot give them a new heart. Rather, it points out people's sin and it shows them the need for God. And so these sacrifices, which were offered day after day after day, could not make people perfect before God. And that brings the question then, um, how could people in the Old Testament be saved? Well, verse 15, it has the answer. Um, it says, a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed when? Under the first covenant. So people who sinned under the first covenant can still be forgiven and redeemed by Christ's sacrifice, which happened later, which didn't happen until roughly uh, 1,500, 2,000 years after that covenant was given. So what it means is that throughout all time, people are saved through the same way. They're all saved through Jesus. There is um, no other name given among men by which we can be saved except through the name of Jesus Christ. That's from Acts 4.12. <clears throat> so it was never the lamb sacrifices or the blood that saved people in the Old Covenant. These were foreshadowing Jesus' sacrifice. So this verse makes it clear. Jesus' sacrifice was applied even to the sins which had already been committed before he died. So in the New Testament era, we are saved because we look back to Jesus' sacrifice and we believe he came, he died, he was buried and he rose again. And we believe in his resurrection. We believe in his crucifixion. We repent of our sins. We place our faith in him. We can be saved. What about people who came before him? They are saved because they look forward to what Jesus was going to do. Um, some of them were more aware of this than others. Um, some of the prophets, they, they uh, discerned what God was saying that uh, a savior was going to come, a Messiah was going to come and they looked forward to that and they placed their faith in that. Um, others didn't really totally understand that yet, but they did have faith in God to save. And salvation is always through faith uh, and through faith alone. Um, so God can act outside of time. And so therefore Jesus' sacrifice can be applied to past, present, and future sins. So that's very interesting because we are creatures of time, right? We are very linear. We, we get older every day. Um, we live in a specific time period. We can't travel back and forth. Does God travel back and forth in time? Um, I don't think it really works that way, but God exists outside of time. Time does not apply to him as it does to us. He's eternal. Uh, he exists forever and ever. He exists outside of time. Uh, his word says that to God a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So God can certainly take Jesus' sacrifice and apply it uh, backwards to those people who believed in him. And to people who were following the sacrificial system, which pointed to the fact that Jesus would one day come and be the ultimate once for all sacrifice to take away people's sins. So how were people saved in the Old Testament? The same way we're saved now through Christ. And they were saved by believing in God, believing in God's promises, believing in God's word, believing in everything that God revealed about himself, uh, just as we do. Uh, it so happens that for us, we know much more about God's plan and he's revealed much more of himself to us. Um, but salvation is still always through faith. Um, in Hebrews 11, when we get there, we will learn that many of the heroes of faith from the Old Testament, they died without finally receiving the promises of God. Um, and yet, here it says that they will receive the promised eternal inheritance. So they didn't receive some of the promises of God in their life on earth, but they will receive them all in the eternal, um, in the eternal state. That is eternal life. Um, so God's promises 
He said that he's going to do this. He's going to send a savior. Um, he's going to do many things for his people. And not all of those um, happened during the time when those prophets lived, uh, but they would all be fulfilled finally one day. And all of those people would fully receive what God promised to them. Now, going forward, it talks about a will. And it says that a will only comes into force or only is um, made effective when the person dies. Um, we know this very well. If I was to write a will and say, uh, okay, I'm leaving um, my possessions to my wife and to my children, that will only happens when I die. And when I die, the will immediately goes into effect. And then the people whom I've left my items to, my materials to, can then receive those things. Um, that is how it works, legally speaking. Um, so what is the author talking about here? It could be a little confusing. Why should the death of the covenant maker be necessary for the covenant to be enforced? After all, God didn't die when he made a covenant with Noah, Abraham, or Moses. But here we can understand covenant in a more general or broad terms. Um, in fact, we often use that when we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, so this is something like a last will and testament. And what the author is saying is that a will only goes into effect when the person who makes it dies. So with this understanding, these verses make sense. Basically, it means for God's salvation and redemption to be fulfilled, then God himself had to die to bring that salvation for us. And that is what Jesus did when he died for us. So this was only fulfilled salvation, the eternal inheritance, the promises were only fully given to us when Jesus himself died. So all of those promises which God makes for his people are confirmed, um, sealed, when Jesus died for us. So these verses show us Jesus' death was necessary, or else God's promises, even those made in the Old Testament, could not take effect. All right, let's go forward, verses 18 through 22. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So, so far, we've looked at the first question, how can people be saved before Christ? And it's still through faith in Christ that he would come to save them. And the second question is, what is this issue with blood uh, in the Bible? Um, and blood is mentioned many times in these verses. Well, first of all, blood was used in the Old Testament to ratify the Mosaic Covenant. Um, and blood is very important. Um, we'll look at Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So when God made a covenant with Abraham, actually animals were killed to ratify the covenant. Um, Noah offered sacrifice to God when God made a covenant with him. Um, the covenant, when he's talking about the rainbow, that he would send the floods, waters over the earth again. Um, but even if we go back farther than that, think about the first death in the Bible. What is it? Uh, you might be thinking about Abel. But actually, there appears to be a death before that. After Adam and Eve sinned, then what happened? Uh, they tried to make clothing for themselves. They tried to make clothing of leaves. Uh, and you could try that, but it doesn't work so well. Um, so God says, not good enough. Um, and that's a reminder that when we sin, we can try to cover it up ourselves, but our own efforts are not good enough. We need help from God. And so God says, I'll help you. And so then he gives them clothes of animal skin. Where did the animal skin come from? They would stand to reason that it came from an animal and that likely God killed that animal in order to make the animal skin for them. Um, unless he just spontaneously created it, which doesn't seem to be generally the way uh, that he works. So if that's the case, then God killed an animal to make clothes for Adam and Eve after they fell into sin. Think about Adam and Eve, how they would have felt. They were tasked to be stewards of God's creation to take care of it. And here's this animal that has to die because of them in order to clothe them, not, not for the animal's 
um, problem. The animal didn't do anything wrong, but because of himself, because of their choice, this other party, this animal, innocent animal has to die for them. That's a very sad thing. Now, for us today, we are somewhat desensitized to death because we see it all over the place and it's in the news um, every day. And we eat animals and meat uh, all the time. But for them, it was the first death they would have been aware of or witnessed. And it was a very ugly thing. And it would have reminded them about their seriousness, um, the seriousness of sin. So blood represents life. How do you feel when you see blood? A lot of people are scared uh, to see blood. They are queasy about blood. If you were to see an animal sacrifice, I'm almost sure it would be a very sickening experience. It's not an enjoyable, it's not a casual thing. It's a very disgusting thing, ugly, horrible to witness. So why do it? Well, that's actually why. It's to tell us that sin is horrible and that a horrible price must be paid for sin. If you sin and then make a cake together, that doesn't really show that the sin is very serious. So the sacrifice is showing you sin is ugly. It's serious. Someone has to pay for that. Um, using blood shows that no half measures will do. We can't just cover it over. We can't just offer a little gift or give a little money um, and everything is, is, is okay. Hunky dory. No. Something has to die. Sin is very serious. It cannot just be forgotten about, cannot be ignored, cannot be swept under the rug. So blood reminds us someone must pay and they must pay with their life. So think about that in the Old Covenant. When a person sins by being uh, disrespectful to parents, by lying, by coveting, whatever it is that they did, they then need to take an animal, an animal from their own flock, which they would have been familiar with this animal's personality and everything. And they need to take this animal and they need to go and then sacrifice it. Wow. That would be a powerful reminder that sin is costly and ugly and terrible. And that someone, something is paying instead of them. Something innocent. The animal didn't do anything. It's their fault and someone else is paying for it. Now, I have to think that anyone who had to offer an animal for their own sins uh, or saw it offered, would be seriously deterred from sinning again because they would want to avoid this experience. If you um, had to go to the market and buy an animal, such as a sheep or a cow, every time you sinned, and then take the animal to the slaughterhouse and there place your hand on its head and have it killed all because of you, would that deter you from sinning? It would certainly deter me. And so this sacrificial system with blood it shows us sin is serious, dead serious. And someone has to pay, uh, someone innocent. Either we pay with our own life in, uh, as God's judgment is put on us or someone else takes that punishment for us. Um, and so that's a lot of what uh, this is talking about here, this, this blood. Um, verse 22 is very well known. It says, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So blood is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. That is how uh, God designed this system to show us how serious it is, um, to show us just... <clears throat> So, so far we have seen the answer to two questions which we asked at the beginning. One is how are people saved before Jesus and it's still through faith in Jesus, uh, looking forward to his coming. And the second is what is the deal with blood in the Bible? And it's because blood shows us the serious nature of our sin. Life is in the blood. Someone must pay. That reminds us that God is a just and a holy God. Let us go forward to the last part and we will learn more about Christ's sacrifice, uh, why he had to die and, and how that works for us. So Hebrews 9, 23 and going forward. <clears throat> Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. 
But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So in the last section, we looked at how blood is working under the Old Covenant, under the Old Testament law. In this section, we'll see <clears throat> how Jesus' sacrifice uh, works for us. So it's comparing Christ's sacrifice with the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament. Now let's look at <clears throat> verse number 3. Um, it says, the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So there is um, the earthly and the heavenly. Uh, so the earthly system under the tabernacle, you have the animals and their sacrifices. So you have the animal sacrificial system. But then here we see that there is a better sacrifice. That is Jesus. Jesus appears, perhaps figuratively, but maybe actually literally in God's presence in heaven on our behalf. It says, verse 24, Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So Christ enters into heaven itself in the presence of the Father, and he's coming on our behalf as our mediator, as our high priest, as our representative a man because of God becoming incarnate and taking on flesh. His sacrifice is better. And remember the main overarching theme of the book of Hebrews. That is Jesus is superior to everything and everyone else. We've seen he's superior to Moses. We've seen he's superior to the Old Covenant, to Levitical priests, to angels. And in this passage, we see that his sacrifice is superior. Is the best sacrifice, perfect, once for all time. He's God's own son. He's eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, and sinless. So his sacrifice is superior and perfect. Now we've looked at the deterrent to sinning of offering blood sacrifice. That is, if you offer an animal sacrifice, you would be deterred from sinning because of the, ugly, the, the ugliness of that, the serious nature of that. Does Christ's sacrifice deter you from sinning? Or does it feel too distant, too long ago to have an effect. How can you think of Jesus' sacrifice in a way that would help deter you from sinning? You see, Jesus' sacrifice should not be a license for us to sin. We should not think, well, Jesus, um, his blood is infinitely valuable. He can forgive all my sins. So I'll just sin again and again and again. And I'll say sorry. And then boom, it will be gone. And, and I'll be fine. And, and I can go sin again. That's not how we are supposed to think about it. We need to realize that Jesus faced real pain for every sin we ever commit. Now, if we approach Jesus' death in a logical manner, we can understand that Jesus took the punishment for us. And I believe that he took every bit of punishment that you and I deserve for our own sins. Therefore, if I commit a hundred sins, Jesus took that amount of punishment. If I commit a thousand sins, Jesus took that amount of punishment. One could argue that Jesus already took that punishment in ancient history, so it doesn't matter. I don't think we need to get too technical about that. It becomes really hard to understand when we think of his sacrifice as applying for all time, that his sacrifice applies to the past, applies to the future, all of these things. We won't get too technical, but we should remember that if we just say, I'm going to sin and sin and sin again, and so his, his uh, sacrifice for me is licensed to sin, we are devaluing it. We are disrespecting it. We are taking it for granted. We are even trampling upon his sacrifice. But if we realize that he is paying the price, he has paid the price for those sins, that should be a deterrent to us from sinning. Imagine if every time you sin, a person you love very much, maybe your spouse or your child is whipped right in front of you. You sin and boom, they're whipped and you sin again and they're whipped again. Wouldn't that deter you from sinning? We can also think of the fact that Jesus is taking our punishment for us and remind ourselves that when we sin, that punishment is heaped on Christ. His sacrifice doesn't mean no one suffers for it. He is the one suffering for it. Now, if sacrificing an animal with no soul, no rational thought, no morals, no emotions would deter us from sinning, 
then how much more should the sacrifice of God's one and only son, the perfect creator of the universe? I don't know what sins you might be struggling with, what bad habits or addictions you might be trying to cast off, but there are lots of systems we can try, accountability systems, um, you know, uh, different groups, um, counselors, all kinds of different things we, which we can try, and many of those things are very, very good to help deter us from sinning. But the key thing is we need to look to the cross and remember that Jesus died for us. Jesus took real punishment for us for those sins. And he died not so that you can just keep doing it again and again. Um, Paul said in Romans, by no means, right? By no means does it mean that we have license to sin. His death should remind us how important it is to live a holy and a righteous life before God. He, his death should remind us of the seriousness of sin. We should not take it for granted, but we should respect him and return love to him. Because he loved us, we should love him. We should return that love to him by refraining from doing those sins which grieve him so much. Let's go forward, uh, verse 25 and 26. Um, and it says he doesn't have to offer himself repeatedly, right? He doesn't have to do this over and over and over again. Um, it says if he had to do it like the priest did in the Old Testament, it says he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. If every sin you commit, um, then he has to go and like sacrifice himself again, multiply that over the billions of people that live in the world, he would need to constantly be sacrificing himself. The author says, of course, it is not that way. It does not need to be repeated. He suffered once, um, at the climax of world history, once for all time. Everything before it was building up to it, everything since then is affected by it. So what application can we get from that? Well, his death is effective. Um, he is powerful to save. We have many, many songs um, in the Christian faith about the blood of Jesus and how powerful it is and how it can wash away our sins and all of that is true because he can and because he did. So we should be thankful that we don't live under the Old Testament and its code and its regulations and its sacrificial systems anymore um, and that you don't have to bear your sin on yourself. You don't have to hold that burden. If you're familiar with the book Pilgrim's Progress, it talks about um, the man who was uh, named Christian who had the burden of his own sins on him and he carried this around like a huge heavy pack on his back all the time. If you've ever been hiking with a large and heavy pack, you know what that would be like. He's saying you don't have to carry that. You don't even have to carry the shame and the guilt from those sins anymore. You don't have to beat yourself up over sins that you committed um, yesterday, last year, decades ago. Those can be forgiven and removed as far as the East is from the West. We can be forgiven. What's the application? Come to Him. Confess our sins to Him so that we can receive that forgiveness from Him. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness is available, but we need to ask for it. It says again here, uh, this phrase is repeated many times in the book of Hebrews that his sacrifice is once for all, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So our salvation in him is secure. A new sin will not require that Christ be crucified again. <clears throat> our salvation is complete. We can't make up for our sins by trying to earn our salvation. Instead, we should entrust ourselves to him and gratefully thank him for his sacrifice. All right, moving forward in verse 27. It says, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Okay, this verse is a very a popular verse um, in that it is a very clear verse which tells us that after death comes judgment. Uh, I often use this verse when I'm sharing the gospel um, to remind people that death isn't the end. Um, there's something more and that we will be held account um, for how we live in this world. Um, this is something that people don't like to talk about. They don't like to think about. One of the major reasons that people don't want to believe in God is because they don't want God to be their judge. They don't want God to be their authority. When you go back to the very first sins, um, Satan, he 
doesn't want to follow God, he wants to be God himself. His was the sin of rebellion, of not wanting God to be God. Um, Adam and Eve too, they cast off God's authority and went their own way and declared their independence. Um, then again, at the Tower of Babel, God says, um, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And people said, um, no, we're not going to spread out. We're not going to fill the earth. We're going to stay right here. We're going to gather together under one banner, the banner of man. And they built the Tower of Babel, which was basically a direct uh, disobedience, a direct rebellion to what God had told them to do. And they were declaring that man, um, man manpower, we are following our own um, flag and not yours. And so that has been mankind's problem from the beginning of wanting to rebel against God and not wanting God's authority. And that's the same reason why evolution is so popular today. People like the idea of evolution on an inner level because it tells them that they have no judge, no standard, no authority, no morals. They are their own boss. They can do whatever they want with no repercussions now or after they die. But that is not what scripture says. Again, it says after that comes judgment. There is a judgment coming one day. How can we pass the judgment? This is the most important exam we will ever face. How can you pass? You cannot pass by your own merits. The only way to pass is if Jesus is standing there and he says, I have already taken his punishment. I've taken that upon myself. If, if, if we've already come to Christ in faith and then our judgment has already been put on his shoulders and his righteousness has already been put onto our shoulders, that trade has already taken place, then we can pass through when this judgment comes. Um, this also tells us that people will die. Um, death is not a topic that's very popular. Uh, most likely the last uh, birthday party or date you went on, um, you were not talking about death with the people around you. Uh, most people don't like to talk about death. It makes them awkward and uncomfortable. And most people, they want to put off, put this off as long as they can. Um, and so there's all kinds of ways people are even trying these days to try to extend their lives um, and to try to, you know, use crypto freezing and other methods to stave off death because they're afraid. They're really afraid of this judgment. They're afraid of meeting their creator. But God has made it so that people die. It's been that way ever since Adam and Eve sinned. God told them, if you eat the fruit, you will die. So this is part of the curse which we are facing now because of their sin. But it's not only a curse, it's actually also grace. Because imagine if you didn't die. Imagine if you had to live in this physical body forever, how that would be. Um, as I'm getting older and, and into middle age, um, my body takes longer to recover. After playing sports, I'm sore, I'm injured. Um, I even have an injury in my calf right now um, because of a basketball game I played a few days ago. And back in my 20s, you know, this, this would be healed very quickly. And the next day I would be up and out again. But the older I get, the slower I get, um, and the longer injuries take to recover. Uh, and you probably feel the same, that we have cough, we have sickness, um, I have allergies. Our bodies are weak. They're not really made to last forever. So we don't even want to be stuck in this body. And it's not just because of its physical limitations. How about sin? I believe you don't want to sin. I believe you are battling against sin, but there's still temptation bombarding us from every direction every day. And inside of this body, we have our old flesh, sin, nature, which means we are constantly fighting against sin. Sometimes thoughts just pop into our mind like, whoa, where did that terrible idea, where did that temptation, where did that evil thing come out from? And we have to fight and work against those things and pray to God for help. So death is actually a grace that we can, we don't have to be in this body forever. He's going to give us a new body. Death can be a new beginning. So either death is the worst thing that ever happened to someone because they immediately come into judgment and they don't pass in their sentence to eternity in hell. Or death is a wonderful thing because it brings us into God's presence and then we can, um, later have a new body, a glorified body, a version 2.0, which is much better than the one that we have right now. In any case, it is very important for us to realize that death is a real thing. Um, in Psalms 90, uh, Moses talked about that a lot. He talked about the brevity of life and how we should realize that because that gives us proper perspective. Psalm 90 verse 3, you return man to dust 
and say, O return, O children of men. So it's important to know, you return man to dust. We are from dust and we'll go back to dust. Then what? Um, let me go forward. He says, verse... Uh, 10, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble, and they are soon gone, and we fly away. In the book of James, it declares our life to like a, a vapor, a mist that appears and vanishes away with the wind. So this gives us a perspective. In Ephesians, it says, redeem the time because the days are evil. So verse 12, this is where the perspective part comes in. He says, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. If you never consider death or you never realize that your time in this earth is limited, you won't have a heart of wisdom. You have a heart of folly, a heart of foolishness to live for each day, to live for the present, to satisfy yourself. We have to realize death is a real thing. We will face God, but that means that our life right now is so much more important because we have an eternal soul. What we do right now will have an effect on us, our soul for eternity, and also on the people around us for eternity. So we should redeem the time. We should use it well. We should have proper perspective. And let me move forward. Um, one more uh, verse here. Verse 17 says, Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So this is Moses' prayer that our work will be established. In other words, he, he said, I don't want my life to be worthless. I don't want my life to be nothing, to be meaningless. I hope that I will do something meaningful in my life that will, that will stand the test of time, that will make a difference, that will have an eternal impact. There's so many people, they live, they, they live their, their time on earth and then they die. It's like, what do they leave behind? Sometimes a, a terrible legacy and sometimes a, a nothing legacy, just, just nothing. It doesn't make much impact on people around them. Sometimes let us live a life that impacts others for the Lord. Let us invest in his kingdom because that is the one that lasts forever. So here's a very practical application from this aspect that man is destined to die once. My time, your time on this earth is limited. Let's use it well. Don't waste your life. Um, one person compared our lives to candles, and there were two people. Um, one had a, a tall candle and one had a short candle. And the short candle represented the life of an older person because most of their candle was already burned up. They just had a short amount of time remaining. The long candle um, represented the younger person because he has more of his life remaining. I don't know where you are on that spectrum, but it's a reminder that every day our candle gets a little bit lower, a little bit shorter. That's one more day that we will never have back. So let's not wait to live for God until the future, until you know you graduate from high school or college or get a job or get a family or retire or some future time when you think you'll have more time available, you won't be so busy and then you can serve God. Let's do it today. Um, you will never get back today. So let's serve God today, one day at a time, have the right perspective, um, knowing that one day we will face him. Uh, let's move forward. The last verse here. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to do with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So his sacrifice assures us that if we believe in him, if we accept his sacrifice on our behalf, when he comes, the second time, then he would take us to be with him. Uh, he will save us. So his first coming was actually a coming to save. He said, I didn't come to bring judgment, but to save. And the second time, um, he says he's coming to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. If we read Revelation, we also see that he, that's one of the purposes for his coming. The other purpose will also be to judge those who rejected him. So if you remember on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished. Um, and his second coming actually verifies that his sacrifice was accepted in a similar way that the high priest coming back out of the Holy of Holies 
showed that his sacrifice on behalf of the people was accepted by God. So once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. They actually tied a rope around his ankle so that if he died inside, perhaps of a, because of a vision or touching the ark or doing something he shouldn't do, they could pull him out. But when he came back alive, it basically showed God accepted his sacrifice. Jesus will come again a second time, and that shows God accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. Are you eagerly waiting for him? Are you looking forward to the second coming? Um, I'm not a prophet. I do not know when he will return. In fact, no one knows. Uh, no one can know the time or the day. Um, but today I was reading Matthew 24, and it talks about uh, earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. And we can look at the news, and we can see that some of these birth pangs are around us in the world today. How long until he returns? We don't know, but it could be at any time. So let's be ready. Let's be living for him, not wasting our life, and eagerly waiting for his second coming. So whether um, it's through us dying or whether it's through Jesus coming again a second time to bring us to ourself, our time in this world is limited. So let's use it very wisely. Uh, so today we are reminded of three questions. Number one, how are people saved before the time of Jesus? They are saved by believing in Jesus and his sacrifice, looking forward to that in the future. The same way as we are saved by looking back to that. Um, second is blood. Um, what is the point of blood in the Bible? Blood shows us the serious nature of our sin and that sin must be punished with a life, an innocent life. And the third part is the sacrifice. Jesus is our once for all perfect sacrifice. And we need to be reminded um, to not take that sacrifice for granted, but his sacrifice should also deter us from sin and remind us that our life is limited. We have a limited amount of time on this earth, so let's use it well. Let's redeem the time, and let's eagerly look forward to his second coming. So as we finish, uh, let's come before the Lord in prayer and, and thank him for what he's shown us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you that salvation is through Jesus alone, that you didn't leave us in our sins. You didn't say this is our problem, um, but you made it yours. Um, and we thank you, Jesus, that you came to become a man to represent us, uh, and to die on our behalf, that your sacrifice is once for all time. Your blood is infinitely valuable. You took our judgment and you gave us your righteousness. We do not deserve that. We cannot pay you back, but we do help. We, we do hope that you will help us to live in a worthy way in light of what you've done for us, not taking it for granted, but being appreciative, knowing our time in this world is short. Lord, help us to live for you uh, faithfully and to eagerly wait for and look forward to your second coming, and in the meantime, to preach the gospel to all nations so more people um, can be saved. Uh, we thank you, and we pray that you will continue to help us to live this out by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives every day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining. Please join us next time. We'll be studying, God willing, Hebrews chapter 10. Please do also like and subscribe. This is a very small way to support this channel and also to tell YouTube to push out this content so that more people can study and obey God's word. Thanks and hope to see you soon.